good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Saul Estrin, and uh, I'm chairing this um, session. I'd like to welcome you to uh, this Department of Management's public lecture given by Dr. Vladimir Kvint on the global emerging market and its role in a time of crisis. Now, um, I, I was looking um, over the weekend uh, um, uh, trying to find more about Dr. Kvint, and I have to say, even by the standards of the speakers we uh, tend to get at LSE, we are, this, uh, this gentleman has a quite extraordinary uh, pedigree. He's the son of two engineers. He was born in Siberia. Um, he's well known for his research as an analyst of events and of strategies, and has been for many years. He, I'm sure he'll mention this, or he might mention this later on, but he's one of the few people who forecast very early on the end of the Soviet Union. He also forecasts the, uh, uh, the ruble default of 1998. Um, he's a highly renowned academic. He was in the uh, Soviet uh, Academy of Sciences, uh, Siberian School of Economics. Um, and uh, he then moved on to Moscow. He visited the West uh, um, from 1988, speaking at places like Harvard, NYU, uh, Woodrow Wilson Center, professor in NYU Stern, and a number of other major U.S. schools, and has now largely moved to the U.S., and he's developed this theory of the global emerging market. At the same time, he's played a big practitioner role, a consultant to cable and wireless, to GEC, to numerous other firms. He may mention some of this. And he's also played a big role as a, a policy advisor, for example, uh, uh, assisting in Bulgaria and Albania, as well as in Russia. Now, He's recently produced a, a book on the global emerging markets, which I was also looking at at the weekend, a pack full both of fact and figures on the one side, and on the other side, uh, strategic evaluations and evaluations of risks and opportunities. Uh, I'm greatly looking forward to this talk, uh, and I'd like you all to welcome Dr. Kavitz. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Estrin, for a uh, wonderful introduction. It's my pleasure and privilege to speak in front of such a distinguished audience. If I'm speaking, if I'm loud enough, uh, I was given a lot of lectures in London and in Western Europe exactly 20 years ago. At that time, uh, my cover story was published in Forbes, and I took this cover story with me. This is my cover story, and it's written, Soviet economists, revolutionary proposal, Russia should quit the Soviet Union. I am not anymore a Soviet economist. Soviet Union disappeared, and nobody interested in forecasts, which became a reality. Everybody asking about new forecasts, new pr predictions, but it's difficult to produce. Um, at that time, entity which I am going to speak, global emerging market, did not exist. At that time, global world was divided, I will go a little bit ahead, was divided in two major categories, developed countries and developing countries. And roughly 90% of all international transactions were among roughly 17, 18 developed countries. US, Canada, Western Europe, maybe Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. That's it. But slowly, out of developing countries, started to appear a new category of countries somewhere back in the 80s. And slowly, this new category of countries, which did not exist roughly 25, 30 years ago, now producing more than 50 percent of global output. They are not only these countries, not only partners of developed countries, they are competitors of most powerful economies, including the United States. And they are like a beacon for remaining developing countries. They, they can now see what they can achieve if they will develop a uh, certain level of freedom, economic freedom, free market, uh, capital market institutions. 
but I will speak about this issue slowly. Uh, through all my studies, I always using strategic approach. Uh, I started my professional life as a simple worker, above Arctic Circle, as a mining, work, mining worker. Then I became a mining engineer, and then economist, and PhD in economics. But then I found out that I am just a strategist. And uh, from that time, I am working in different countries, in, on different continents as a strategist including companies like uh, Professor Estrin mentioned, but I also would like to underline only two or three of them. Arthur Anderson, when, where I was deputy chief strategist and created first global emerging market department back in 92. Then Mitra Media, at that time also the largest telecom company. And later uh, in several other companies, now I am on the board of directors of largest uh, architectural company in the world, RMGM. It's a uh, uh, country which, uh, it's company which originated from Scotland, from Edinburgh. I don't know, but I believe few representative of RMGM is here. I would like to tell you a few words about global trends. You cannot make any predictions. You cannot make any forecasts if you will not find out the most important, the most powerful global trends. Then you have to select them. Then you have to understand their influence on the issue which you are studying. And then you can understand the future, more or less. Uh, when I started to think about uh, not all emerging market countries, I did not know that I ever will create this term global emerging market. But at that time, I was studying uh, my motherland, Soviet Union. And uh, for some reason, I started to think that days of this country are numbered. But why? And I will give you one example, not from Soviet Union. I have been, I was uh, teaching and giving consultations in Albania to Albanian government and president. And I asked Albanian people how they found out way to the future, how they found signals of freedom and taste of freedom. They told me through telecommunications. They lived in the most self-isolated country in the world under dictator of Hodja. But Telecom and radio development technologies gave them signals from Italy. Almost every single Albanian after that studied Italian. And despite of all, despite of all restrictions, they started to listen the truth from, Alba from Italy. When technological revolution started to influence all other global trends, new global trend appeared, several of them. First of all, globalization and the most important, democratization. Totalitarian regimes, dictatorships started to disappear from the political map of the world. First of all, a military dictatorship in Greece, Turkey, Argentina, Brazil. Then communist dictatorship disappeared. Then personal dictatorship like in uh, Philippines, Indonesia. And this process still continuing. I wouldn't tell you that all dictatorship disappeared. But even remaining dictatorship, or most of them, not the same, not on the same level of brut brutality than it was 20, 30 years ago, and which I experienced through my personal life. When democracy came, smaller and smaller ethnic groups started to look and smaller nations started to look for their statehood. And political disintegration started. The most famous cases, of course, former Soviet Union disintegrated in 15 countries, former Republic of Yugoslavia disintegrated in five, six, and now in seven countries. And this trend is, sorry, this trend is continuing, still continuing. Few years ago, Next door to the United States province, Quebec, Quebec, voted several times to be part of Canada or not. And only by 1.4% during last referendum, 
supporters of uh, to be a part of Canada won. It could be opposite. And many countries like that, in Belgium, Italy, worldwide global trend. Eritrea appeared from Ethiopia. Just recently, East Timor became an independent country, a member of United Nations, but it used to be part of Indonesia, and fighting for their freedom for ages. When country getting political independence, they are looking for economic integration and global economic integration and regional economic integration became very, very powerful global trend because it's a very bad idea to politically, uh, to economically isolate itself from other world. I will tell you also uh, about my a little bit painful experience. When I started to publish articles that Soviet Union will disappear and especially when I wrote uh, at the beginning of 90 sentence that by 1992 there will be no country called Soviet Union. I was especially welcomed by uh, Baltic states countries. Uh, tell me when Soviet Union disappeared. Who can tell me? December 91, just at Christmas time. And several Baltic states got political independence, declared political independence even before. But some of them started uh, to go far away from necessity. They started to cut all economic ties with Russia. And I published uh, one study, and it was also quoted in Forbes again, I am writing for Forbes last 20 years, a little bit more, uh, they, the numbers was very simple. If economic ties with Russia will be cut by 30%, economic decline in Baltic states will be roughly by 70, 72%. And I immediately became hand of KGB and all opposite direction. And what's happened after that? Lithuania, Lithuania cut off connections with Russia, and it was total economic disaster, unemployment. And then was politically democratic election of new president. And guess who won? Former secretary of Communist Party of Lithuania. How come? Simple. He declared political independence, but economic integration and... Uh, People were very unhappy when economic integration was uh, disappearing from the day-to-day -day life. So it's pretty powerful trend. And if you can see it's global, European Union, of course, best example, but Mercosur, it's like a European Union of South Con of South America, ASEAN in Asia, uh, ECOWAS, uh, and many of, of them, Association of uh, Western African States, in every single continent, several regional economic blocks with a different level of economic integration, of course. Uh, when countries became politically independent, they found out, especially newly elected democratic leaders, that they are not only political leaders, they also owned a lot of property. In some dictatorship, up to 94% of national wealth we belong to state, not to private business. And global trend of privatization came on new level. By the way, this trend, privatization, started not in emerging market countries, not in developing countries, actually in England. And I had honor many years ago to work with uh, David Young, who later became sir, and then Lord David Young, during Margaret Thatcher reign, uh, he was minister, minister or sec, minister of industry, and he was a key man for privatization in Great Britain, which tremendously improved efficiency of British economy. And I asked him, David, what is the most important characteristic of privatization? It was 89, before Soviet Union even disintegrated, and his answer was one word, corruption. It's always like that. When on one side of the table, private interest, and another side of the table, the table occupied by bureaucrat whose compensation not related to 
efficiency of his deal as a representative of state interest during the process of privatization, then corruption appeared. And global trend of privatization became most powerful in emerging market countries when they started to sell the state-owned properties to private hands and corruption sky raising. And I saw this corruption in many countries in the world. I remember I worked in Brazil and Minister of Economics, who later became president, told me they were the most corrupt country in the world. I told, don't be uh, so sure. I know a few more corrupt countries. Uh, when global emerging market appeared, totally changed situation with capital. I told you, prior to 80s, very few countries were ready to accept foreign direct investment. Very few. I remember I worked with comp Italian company Rizzoli, and chief investment officer was telling me it was 87. He came to Russia. At the time, I had no right to travel abroad. He told me, um, Professor, we need to find place where to invest. Tremendous comp competition for investment projects. When emerging market appeared, huge market which occupied roughly uh, 45 percent of global territory and 70 percent plus of global population situation changed to opposite lack of capital shortage of investment too many opportunities and countries and companies started to compete for foreign direct investment but not all global trends are positive, some of them extremely dangerous for, for development of global business. I am speaking about terrorism and extremism. In a few seconds, I will show you a couple of slides which you will find how terrorism influences uh, global business community with exact numbers, and you will see these trends. Uh, finally, another negative global trend which brought globalization. Globalization, what is, where is the difference between world economy and global economy? We are still living the time of world economy. But inside world economy and appeared new economic entity, uh, global marketplace. And global emerging market is part of this global marketplace. Because of global, global marketplace represents new level of economic integration, any problems appeared in a few countries, like, if, like effect domino, the influencing majority, if not all countries in the world. By the way, during uh, this 18 months of current crisis, I visited several countries, many actually countries, every year, not less than 20. And I found a couple of countries which not under, for different reasons, which did not experience whatsoever influence of global crisis. It's interesting. Um, this table I, I showed you already that it really represents that with birth of emerging market, global economy accelerated. This, is, uh, this, is, uh, this table shows that even in time of crisis and before crisis, Positive numbers of global output substantially supported by high level rate of growth of emerging market countries and their territories. I took just few of them. Sorry, my screen doesn't work here. This is uh, input. This is the role of leading, global, leading emerging market countries in the world economy. If you can see out of 10 countries, four already emerging markets, Russia, Brazil, India, China, and very soon is Korea is coming. By the way, we all live in 21st century, but me personally, I've been in 21st century only twice, when I visited Taiwan and recently South Korea. It's only where I found all characteristics on, of 21st century. Regarding GEM, GEM is a global emerging market, it's the title of my book, and as you can see, entity, global emerging market, which did not exist in 1980-85, now 
now overcome more than in two times the United States, still leading power in the world. Oh, sorry, wrong direction. Uh, in terms of GDP per capita, situation is not so positive. Efficiency of economy in emerging market countries still substantially behind uh, majority of developed countries. Uh, this is an interesting uh, slide. This slide shows that emerging market countries will play more important role when new industry will appear additionally to traditional industries of uh, services industry and agriculture will appear a new industry, economy of knowledge or knowledge-based economy. In this table, as you can see, role of emerging markets of South Eastern Europe is extremely powerful, but I would like to tell you, I already told, that Southeast Asia, especially Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, among leading countries in knowledge economy. Uh, birth of emerging market countries uh, started to, to attract new uh, investment. And, uh, and now, as we speak, 43% of all global emerging, all, uh, sorry, foreign direct investment go into emerging market countries, 43%. It's entity which did not exist. In terms of GDP per head, obviously, then smaller countries and important. It's easy to get high numbers of uh, foreign direct investment compared to GDP. But I found out very simple number. If uh, FDI in the country, foreign direct investment, per capita below $1,000, they're not playing any economic role just jewelry. But if FDI overcome 1,000 and especially $1,200 per capita in the country, they are playing very, very important role and positively influence uh, economy of the country. Uh, another interesting trend, with birth of global emerging market, Speed of development of FDI overcomes speed of development of global output and global trade. But look, at time of crisis in 2001 and during economic uh, current crisis, FDI disappearing. They go into their homes or to Luxembourg. Uh, this table, uh, I would like to, uh, to show you for one reason. I would like to demonstrate that common sense and opinion of majority does not work in strategy. Everybody knows that China and US ha has strange trade balance, always negative for the United States. By the way, I tried to find out when was the first year uh, when the last year when U.S. had positive trade balance with China, I found out it was 1984. So it's not related to political leadership in the United States. It's all result of strategy. Unlike China, U.S. does not have strong foreign trade strategy. China actually is the only country in the world which has strong, developed, long-term, 100 years national strategy. And when I am asking people why the United States has negative trade balance with China, what is typical answer? That China has uh, cheaper labor resources. I am usually asking who has cheaper labor resources, United States or Japan? Obviously, United States has cheaper labor resources, but Japan has positive trade balance with China. European Union most of the years has positive trade balance with China, but in, U in European Union labor resources more expensive than in US. So it's not an issue of cheap labor resources. Another typical 
opinion of majority, which is definitely wrong, what U.S. buying in China. Majority of people saying jeans, baseball caps, T-shirts, toys, not at all. First two positions, it's high-tech or lower-tech equipment. And I took only few most important positions where U.S. has most negative trade balance. It means that U.S. does not have foreign trade strategy. This is why foreign trade balance in U.S. since 1984 always negative. By the way, I found out when the last single month when U.S. has positive foreign trade balance with China, April 86. Now I will tell you a few words about emerging markets. In uh, January of 2008, I was presenting uh, draft of my book, latest book, before it was another book on the same topic, uh, Global Emerging Market in Transition. This book called Global Emerging Market Strategic Management and Economics. When I was presented at uh, uh, IMF, and in UN, by the way, this book I presented in Economic and Social Council of UN in February, on February 9th of this year. But in January of 2008, I was presenting draft of this book in uh, IMF. And I took the latest report of IMF on global economy. And I found out that they are using category of emerging markets, but not systematically. The same country can appear in category country in transition, developing country, emerging market country, and country of advanced technology. Then they summarize all numbers, and we are getting wrong statistic. Because IMF, as well as World Bank, but the most important IMF, they, have no, they do not have clear definition of emerging market. Now I will present to your judgment, my definition of emerging market country. Sorry, it's wrong. We are in wrong slide. We will not speak about This is the definition. Emerging market country has society in transition from dictatorship, not just to free market immediately, to free market-oriented economy with high level of economic freedom, why I'm underlining economic, not political freedom? Because business and investors, they're not looking for political freedom, believe, believe it or not. Business are cynical. They're looking for economic freedom. This is why in some countries where political freedom are very questionable, China, Bahrain, Estonia, maybe, has the highest level of economic freedom. Uh, gradual integration within global marketplace, so, so country trying to be part of global business community. Very important development of middle class. No middle class, no stability in the country, and purchasing power of the country very low. Uh, many years ago when I worked in Brazil, uh, I, um, I was team leader for uh, privatization of Telebras, the largest telecom company in South Hemisphere. And I was trying to evaluate purchasing power, uh, potential sales of mobile phone in Brazil, nations of, at that time, 165 million people. And I found out that out of 165 million people, only roughly 23, 25 million at that time, now 35 million, really who are buying something, especially uh, high, high technology. Uh, emerging market can, oh, by the way, I would like to return to this very important point. Stability is a key issue. No stability, no foreign direct investment, and local domestic inv investors are going out of the country. Country for stability required tolerance, religious, ethnic, social tolerance. Tolerance is a key issue. And finally, cooperation with multilateral institutions. This is why it's so important that during last meeting, G20 meeting, uh, 
leaders of G20 agreed to change shares, roles of emerging market countries on voting bodies of multilateral institutions. Emerging market countries are not homogeneous. Some of them on high level, on high phase of economic development, uh, I called it economies in bloom, some eco economic democracies, economies in bloom, the best example, Czech Republic, Hungary, South Korea, Singapore. Emerging market democracies, there are a lot of them now. Uh, oligarchic emerging markets, it's Russia, Ukraine, Indonesia, and few other, Kazakhstan. Emerging market dictatorship, many of them you know better. Uh, Pre-emerging markets, which are very close but remaining developing countries, which are trying to be in this category. Uh, when I started to work uh, with classification of countries, in my book, roughly 20 different approaches to classify countries which belong to emerging markets, which belong to developing countries, that it will be not my subjective point of view. I found this problem when I worked for Arthur Anderson and our clients. Arthur Anderson had roughly 100,000 employees and 100,000 clients, the same number. Uh, I found out that it's important to find objective approach. I tried to find any, uh, due to my background, any mathematical approach and found only one. Back in, in 50s, uh, Professor Bennett at Stanford University developed this algorithm. But when I started to use this algorithm, it didn't work. And he did not develop indicators for this algorithm. I choose the following indicators, mostly technologically oriented and uh, economic freedom oriented. And then uh, slightly redesign that algorithm because with this indicator, the algorithm did not work. This algorithm, which I started to use back in 95, even during time of my work at uh, Arthur Anderson and at Fordham University in New York, and uh, it works, but not only way how I categorize countries. Uh, on this table, I selected few countries and showed you how they can be categorized by Bennett algorithm with my indicators or by my algorithm. In some cases, like Sweden or, uh, I would say, Germany, they are very close. In some situations, like Luxembourg, the difference is tremendous because that algorithm of Bennett did not orient for technological indicators. Uh, this is the current status quo of global emerging market role. 83 countries, according to my classif classification, some authors have different opinion, but not substantially. I never saw categorization less than 50 countries in category of emerging markets. Gross world product almost more than 51 percent, FDI 43, population almost 69. And this market did not exist in the 80s, at the beginning of the 80s. Uh, how different countries were acting during time of economic crisis, during the last 18 months. And as you can see, majority of countries which using stimulus packages, emerging markets, Arab Emirates, China, Russia, Kuwait, Hong Kong, Kazakhstan, Malaysia, and so on. This is different uh, financial stimulus which use in countries. And again, as you can see, by different categories, majority of them emerging markets. And this is only emerging markets. And at the bottom, uh, percentage of different indicators. And the most popular, if you can see, investment in infrastructure and providing of liquidity, All the, almost the last one. Um, 21st century will change attitude of global community to natural resources. 
Number one natural resource will be not oil, gas, or coal. It will be fresh water resources. And this is two leading countries in terms of fresh water resources, Brazil and Russia. But even two of these countries will experience tremendous problem during this century. Why? Because different allocation of industry, economic development, and water resources. And to build water pipeline, technologically even more difficult than to build oil pipelines or gas pipelines due to corrosion and many other issues. Uh, I wouldn't like to speak about this, uh, natural resources. Another interesting slide, it seems to me interesting. It's ruined common opinion that uh, emerging market countries have low level of education. It's not true. Statistics shows that in terms of people with university education, among top uh, five, uh, three emerging market countries. Another typical mistake, where capitalization in, uh, has the highest speed. Again, this is the average world at the, on the right. US is an outsider in terms of rate of growth of capitalization. European Union below world average, but major emerging market countries all above world average. They are really locomotive of global capitalization. Uh, this is uh, shares in the global marketplace in terms of capitalization and again, emerging market countries overcome European Union. It's easy to understand. Uh, you cannot find any European or American bank which did not develop yet their branches in emerging market countries, plus obviously population, 70% of population. This slide shows uh, why in some countries, in very few, during time of crisis, we are seeing not inflation, but deflation. And leading in deflation, uh, sorry, we are seeing uh, deflation, not, uh, we are seeing inflation, not deflation. And the leading on this is Russia. And as you can see, until recently, during year of elections, M2 cash practically in hands of people and in, on accounts and bank accounts tremendously increasing. It's empty money. Then after uh, end of year of election, it's decreasing, except after 2007. It's mostly related with huge amount of cash appeared in the countries. But Brazil showed opposite direction because it was uh, very difficult municipal elections and a lot of empty money were printed. This is a ch chart with uh, foreign currency reserves. As you can see, UK and US among outsiders. They don't need actually much of foreign currency reserves. They print in real money. Uh, but China, Japan, Russia, India among leaders. It's how you can see in global shares. US has 1% of uh, foreign currency. And obviously that emerging market are global leaders. Uh, bank assets, again, uh, emerging markets still behind Europe, but overcome the United States. You remember at the beginning of lecture, I told you that emerging market countries not anymore just the partners for developed countries. They are competitors. And this slide shows how companies from emerging market countries buying properties, in developed countries. In my book, I have similar slides for several countries, but this is for the United States. As you can see, leading India, Russia, South Korea, Brazil, Israel, China. But if there will be no political restrictions, leading countries will be China and United Arab Emirates. I will avoid this. Uh, I would like to show this slide. This slide was developed by 
Nobel Prize in Economics, Simon Kuznets, who, by the way, oh, among very few economists, who got uh, his economic education in Russia. To be exact, according to current situation in Ukraine, he graduated in Kharkov University. And according to his study, Kuznets curve, initially, with increasing of standard of living, inequality in distribution of wealth is increasing and then decreasing symmetrically, but not in emerging market countries. And I try to, do, to use this curve for many countries, do not work. And then I found out the difference, corruption. In emerging market countries, corruption is so high and so influential that equilibrium of Kuznets does not work. This is global corruption. And as you can see, Africa obviously leading. And then poor countries and the higher corruption, mostly. And also, then less, then shorter democratic history in the country, of the country, than higher level of corruption. This is uh, overall how to do business. Where too easy, doing business easy. Russia uh, is not the worst one, as you can see. And uh, China not in good shape, even it's the biggest destination of foreign direct investment. So difficulties is not the main obstacle for foreign investors if they are looking, if they can smell high profit. It's uh, starting business. The easiest countries, Australia and Japan, and the most difficult. This is in terms of property registration. Uh, Russia not in bad shape, but there is another problem in several countries, including Russia. It's a risk of clean title, because in countries where process of restitution never took place, very often difficult to recognize who is the owner of the property. You can buy it from one hand and then you will find yourself in court because three other companies or individuals uh, applying for the same uh, uh, ownership. So clean title, it's very difficult to get. This cross-border trade, it's obvious that if country is not a member of WTO, it's more difficult to work with, and more restrictions, and more uh, custom duties, and so on and so far. In majority of countries, I recently experienced myself problem, in majority of countries, textbooks for students, free of custom charges. Uh, my publishing house uh, sent a uh, few copies of my book to Russia, it was bought in by Russian government for libraries. And they have to pay not only for book, but for custom duties as well. So, any questions, Professor Restin? Thanks very much indeed um, for this really uh, fascinating uh, survey of, well, an enormous amount about emerging markets that we've learned this evening. Um, Roger Vint has agreed to take questions, so if anyone has any questions, he'll stay there and uh, uh, answer them. So it's open now to the floor. When no question, it's everything clear or everything unclear. <laughs> um, Sergei Dvornikov, Russian by descent. I have a good question. Uh, you sp this was like a uh, global emerging market uh, presentation. So I don't see where you... You, you spoke a ah, lot okay. about uh, Russia specifically. Uh, I thought you live in the U.S. right now. Are you still on Russian payroll or why, why Russia was playing such a big part in your presentation? First of all, first of all, it's my motherland. In my passport it's written I was born in Russia. Second of all, I was raised in the uh, place of Gulag and Russia always can, uh, it's part of my soul. Third, recently, after 20 years living in the US, I am US citizen, by the way, I was recently elected as a chair of financial strategy department at Moscow State University. And I hope the same with you. You cannot avoid your Russian motherland from your soul. <laughs> yes? Okay, it's up to you. Yeah. 
Thanks very much. Tendik Tunistanov, I was formerly a researcher here. Uh, your definition of emerging markets, which is fascinating, uh, is mainly based on processes, increasing middle class, growing social stability. Uh, however, it lacks a, a, a it. conventionally important characteristic of those processes, which is sustainability. I know it was done intentionally, but if your definition contained that important characteristic, which is sustainability, what sort of implications could it have on your theory? In my book, there is a list of 45 major characteristics of country. If you would like to be strict, not just to get information from lecture, you can look at this list. It's 45 characteristics. Uh, I did not make this uh, uh, number of characteristics rounded. It just found through, uh, some of them through experience, some of them when I tried to use quantitative approach. I did not present quantitative approach because I already found out that a couple of people uh, left to sleep, so I decided to not use mathematical approach. But major issue that it's country in dynamic. They quite recently did not exist on global business map. Some of them did not exist even politically. Several countries never had political independence. They're going through tremendous transformation, politically, economically, their business, and even their ethnic identification. This is why first characteristic is country in transition. Uh, Hi. You spoke a lot about China and its rise. You touched on its 100-year plan and its uh, high-quality manufacturing. Uh, there seems to be a common consensus now that this is China's century and so on and so forth. What challenges do you see toward China specifically that could stop them from rising? What could hurt them? Mm -hmm. First of all, I disagree that it's century of China. My opinion, it's century of Latin America. The most interesting dynamics we will find in Latin America. It's maybe out of political loop. There is no any uh, great uh, processes over there except few countries which choose to go to left from right. But in general, it's continent which gives tremendous opportunities, much higher level of tolerance, much higher level of development of capital market institutions, but China will be a global player, will be among global leaders. Very soon, in a matter of 15 years, uh, United States will be second in terms of global indicators. But I don't see in any foreseeable future that China can overcome leading countries, even the United Kingdom, in terms of GDP per head. Majority of Chinese population live in total, total poverty. Tremendous progress in major cities. I am quite often in China. I finished recently one uh, consulting project in mainland China. I worked a few years uh, as an advisor for leader of Taiwan. So I know that part of the world, more or less. And I have to tell you that major issue of that part of the world will be political freedom. And time for this, for this political freedom is not come yet. Hi, um, thanks Hi. for coming. Um, Thank you. Since you've done a lot of work on emerging markets and uh, looking at, at the growth of these economies, um, could you tell us to what extent you found a correlation between political liberalization and growth, or if you found a correlation at all? It's a very serious issue. I have to tell you that uh, not all countries, not leadership of all emerging market countries choose way of political liberalization, but majority. When level of economic development increasing and level of political freedoms not increasing or on very slow pattern, sooner or later it will be exposure. Explosion, sorry. So it's dangerous to not increase level of political freedom. Very few countries in the world which are not increasing freedom, political freedom. And their days more or less number. China is a different story. 
they tremendously increase uh, economic freedom, they increase from total brutal dictatorship, they increase level of political freedom as well. I read very interesting document. It's conversation between uh, Mao Zedong and Comrade Khrushchev when he came to China in 59. At that time, Comrade Mao Zedong introduced to Comrade Khrushchev, very young, 26, I guess, years old, Deng Xiaoping. At that time, Deng Xiaoping already had ideas about economic strategy. And his point of view was, doesn't matter which color of cat, uh, if uh, she is still uh, able to buy, to get mice. So the point is that China choose keep their political goals, communist ideas, but increase level of uh, development of free market institutions. This is why days of communist system is in China were prolonged. Do you have any forecast for Cuba? <laughs> yes, I have. <laughs> With the death of uh, two brothers, communist leadership in Ch Cuba will be finished. The same as in North Korea. It's a family business. <laughs> yes, we finally got a question from down below. These guys have been uh, carrying all the way. So let's go down here, please. Yes. Um, you mentioned how um, you feel that China's most of China's population is in absolute poverty. Uh, sorry, where are you? Uh, okay, I did not get your question. Can you repeat, please? Um, you mentioned how you feel that uh, most of China's population is in absolute poverty. Um, what do you think it would take to alleviate that poverty in emerging market countries like China and India? It's a two very different country. China, unlike China, India has high level of political freedom. It's the biggest democracy in the world, it's common opinion. But in China first, it's important to liberalize, liberalize agricultural population, peasants. When you go in out of the city, when you are traveling through Chinese villages, you see, you see stone age time, people in cold water. I've been there, for example, in April. Cold water, people staying on the rice fields uh, until their knees in this cold water for days. And they're using only mules. That's it. But when you go into the cities, you see progress, tremendous progress, great changes. But majority of population still live in agricultural areas, in rural areas, without passports. They are not allowed to travel to the cities. I saw one guy who tried to go to a railroad station in Shenyang. It's to the north of Beijing. And he was beaten up by policemen. I asked why he is beaten up. He has no right to go to railroad station without special permission. The same if you are trying to go without special permission from mainland China to uh, Hong Kong. Uh, I know that there's been some debate over whether India will surpass China as a global power. Um, do you have an opinion on that? Uh, I have an answer for this. Uh, 20 years ago, I was giving lecture at uh, uh, Free Brussels University. And uh, after that, I was invited to town hall, but I came too early. And I went behind town hall, and I found small statute, uh, worker with shuffle. And it's written written two words under this monument, freedom works, because India is a real freedom. India chose very wrong economic model after communist Soviet Union, and they only started to develop uh, free market institutions. They started to be less is self-isolated only in 1994. So they, they lost 
uh, roughly uh, 20 years of economic reform. China started its economic reforms roughly in 1976. So I have very positive opinion about Indian uh, future. In terms of population, India uh, overcome China roughly in 19, uh, sorry, in 2020. And productivity of labor in, in, in India already higher. GDP still is behind, but productivity on companies already higher. And look how resilient was Indian economy during current crisis. Because India positioning itself and developing itself as a global place for technological and high-tech and software outsourcing. This is why during time of crisis, India showed rate of growth 5.7, Professor, you mentioned in your, um, in your talk that you found, sorry, here, mm -hmm. you found cases of um, countries that have not been impacted much by the current crisis. Can you tell us some examples and perhaps why? Okay. Uh, one country which is in best shape, it's Turkmenistan. Uh, look, it's seven million people. It's not a small country, higher than average size of European country, but this country was largest producer of the natu natural gas, on the top 10 of oil, and on the top four of cotton. And it's all small country. And this country recently started, it used to be a very tough dictatorship. Now a new dictator came. He is a dictator, but different one. I met with him, very different one. I will tell you, one of his first decree was, if anybody will prohibited development of internet in high school will immediately fight and he established criminal law for uh, creating barriers for internet development. He rebuilt uh, high, 10 years of high school education. He rebuilt National Academy of Sciences and he sent in his students abroad. I have been an apartment of simple people in Turkmenistan. I would like to live apartment, uh, in an apartment like that. Four meters tall, ceiling, beautiful, and, they, and everybody can get it because he is giving good uh, loans, very cheap loans. Why? Too much natural resources. But it's still dictatorship. Another country which much less experiencing difficulties during last crisis, it's Turkey. Why? What was called Asian crisis started in 1997 in Malaysia, Thailand. It was in fact first global economic crisis. It started in 97 in, in Asia, then it went through Middle East, uh, destroyed Russian ruble in 98, and eventually in finished in December 2001 uh, when uh, Brazilian Pesa and, uh, sorry, Brazilian uh, real and Argentinian peso was destroyed. It was global crisis. During that crisis, Turkey experiencing very difficult time. 50 banks were closed. And Turkish leadership, very experienced Turkish government, got a lesson. And they were much better prepared to current crisis. Unlike Turkmenistan, they experience in problem, but much less than neighboring countries, much less than United Kingdom, for example. Um, yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, well, in your uh, definition of the global emerging markets, uh, the significant players mostly have the big, I, huge... Sorry. I didn't get it. In my definition, what? Of uh, global emerging markets. Um, the huge significant players uh, had uh, quite signif uh, big populations. You're talking of Russia, you're talking of China, India. They're quite big. What of country, do you see any other kind of emerging markets which is also quite a significant player without uh, huge populations? I am speaking about every single country from 
uh, to tiny countries as well. Uh, for example, on this list, a lot of small countries, if you ever heard St. Lucia, for example, or uh, not very big country, Georgia, and uh, many other countries. It doesn't matter, actually. Size of population, it doesn't matter. Only one reason. If you, I don't know where is it, if you have good relationship with global community, if countries develop in free market institution, it's easy to be closer to prosperity in smaller countries. Small countries can get help. Who can help China? Nobody, it's too big. But in fact, uh, I was criticized IMF back in 2008, that biggest recipient of money from IMF is China because by their definition is still underdeveloped country. But I guess now they're changing it because it's outdated classification. But small, a lot of small nations in uh, Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, they're already emerging markets, but they're quite different. For example, I will give you example, two more or less countries with the same size, of the same size, Uruguay and Paraguay. Uruguay is an emerging market. He had center capital of uh, Montevideo is the capital of Mercosur. Paraguay is part of Mercosur. But Paraguay is still developing countries and uh, by many characteristics still underdeveloped. Why, you can ask me why Paraguay is part of Mercosur. Very simple, uh, because people are clever who created Mercosur. If country, if block, regional block has underdeveloped countries, uh, this block allowed for protectionist measures. This is why European Union are not allowed, but Mercosur is allowed to make protectionist measures because of membership of Paraguay and Mercosur. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, this lady in the front row here. It's slowly coming. First of all, thank you very much for your very interesting lecture. Thank you. I represent here my country, Kazakhstan, which is part of your uh, global uh, emerging market. And uh, within this category, it is new, uh, within uh, newly independent state. And my question is uh, on uh, national identity issues. Uh, does your research on global uh, emerging markets include uh, the problem of national identity formation? Uh, especially uh, in case of Kazakhstan, which is multi-ethnic, which include uh, more than 120 uh, nationalities. What is, uh, what should be priority for this kind of emerging markets? No, I'm wrong direction. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for your question. Of course, I said when I analyze this global trend that as soon as political freedom and global trends of democratization uh, taking power over particular land, people of this land looking for national identity and for their statehood. And global trend of political disintegration appeared only because of interest of nations to develop their own statehood. And Kazakhstan is uh, maybe the best example of this. This country never ever had in history its statehood, but now it's very successful, I would say very successful country, uh, despite of its very young age as a state, not as a nation. Nation is much older than state, obviously. Uh, Kazakhstan has all characteristics of emerging market countries. In my classification, it's a, it's oligarchic emerging market because oligarchy very close with political power. I've been in Kazakhstan uh, many times. I have to tell you that Kazakhstan given a lot of attention to technological development. I will give you a couple of numbers. In Russia, uh, registered oil reserves, it's enough for 24 years. Registered, not predicted. In Kazakhstan for 44 years. But Kazakhstan, unlike Russia, recently adopted program of production biotechnological uh, fuel based on biological raw materials, mostly ethanol and now they are looking for butanol. 
At the moment, I was speaking with your leader. I gave him uh, one number, some calculation. If domestic consum consumption of oil will decrease by 30%, time of using registered resources from 44 years will become 80 years, almost doubled. And Kazakhstan, among no, the only one former Soviet bloc countries, started immediately to build two ethanol plants, and now both of them already in use. By these standards, Kazakhstan closer to Europe than former Soviet bloc countries. Thank you. There's a lot of questions, but I'm only going to take, I think, uh, one or two more, because we've been, uh, I think we've possibly had a, a, a taken enough of Dr. Kalint's time, but let me just take one here. Thanks. Um, it seems like you've given us an I don't see, sorry, again? Sorry, what, again? S slowly. Sorry. It seems like you've given us a really good current snapshot of what's going on with emerging markets. But I'm wondering, going forward in terms of economic recovery, what role will emerging markets play? How important will it be? Will they play a role? Good. It's my mistake that I did not describe clearly that I am forecasting mostly. I am a forecaster and strategist, so I'm mostly working with the future. For me, current is the past. Strategists lived, live in the past and working with the future. In terms of future, I presented one slide. I, I, it's difficult for me to find this slide, sorry. Uh, this one. It shows that emerging market countries has much higher dynamics. Now look for crisis. During time of crisis, emerging market countries, the only countries which shows positive rates of growth, rate of growth. And the locomotive, as I said, I remember, uh, of global development. This year, it seems to me, unlike World Bank, world GDP will be in positive field and only because of input of global emerging market, especially China, India, and few small countries, well, less well known, like Ghana, for example. It's emerging market with very positive economic development. Unfortunately, Russia this year will have negative uh, rate of growth of GDP, and next year, first half of the year will be also difficult. But majority of uh, Latin American countries will be next year already in positive zone. Russia will be in positive in 2011, and rate of growth will again will be pretty high. So emerging market countries, in terms of rate of growth pattern, patterns, has much better future than developed, developed nations. Okay, I'll take one last question. Um, Professor, I'm interested by your influential trends uh, slide and how that applies to Europe because in Europe there has been a regional economic integration but there seems also to be rather than devolution political integration. Do you see that as a trend that will continue and is that the only way that Europe will retain its economic position that it has now? Uh, I am professional in emerging markets. Nonetheless, many, many years ago when several scholars disputing creation of Euro, at that time it, this currency had different name, as you remember maybe, uh, we are disputing political integration. And uh, I would like to be politically correct, but my opinion that economic integration is more important for developed world than creation of extra body which people of the nations can not directly influence. It's what I can answer. You know, I read one book, I will tell you. It was written by one of the first Nobel laureates in economics. Despite of all the respect to this person, I disagree with his book because he was uh, discussing creation of global government. It seems to me it's a very dangerous idea. I think on that note, um, 
on behalf of us all, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Gavin. It's thank been you. a fascinating. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.